Dr. Shauna Panja, thank you very much for joining us on Australia in Space TV and here in Perth for the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, you were on a panel of astronauts uh, here yesterday. It's been a pleasure to have you in Perth. Uh, you've been on uh, morning radio and the like. You're quite a celebrity. Uh, but we do find astronauts do have that, uh, that star pull. Power. That, yeah, star <laughs> power. Thank you. Uh, you even used the, uh, the dad joke today of a stellar, stellar performance, right? I can't help it. <laughs> um, look, again, it, it's more about the serious nature of, of the work that you do. Uh, you are heading to space in 2026 with Virgin Galactic. Yep. You're a physician yep. uh, and a practicing one. You're still doing your own research and the like. Yep. So there's a lot to unpack. Absolutely. Uh, so maybe let's just start with your, your next space flight yeah. uh, with Virgin Galactic. Yeah, what's, what's the plan? 2026, so you, the countdown is on for you. Absolutely. So I uh, work with the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. This will be our institute's second ever research space flight. I was one of the lead scientists on our first research space flight and we have since announced our our second space uh, our second space flight which will be an all female crew with astronauts from the US Ireland and of course myself from Canada and we just released our call for science to the international science community Australia included Wow! and we have a focus on biomedical sciences as well as physical sciences with a special interest in neuroscience women's health and health technology supporting both astronaut health as well as remote and rural health care very broad uh, how many sort of experiments and the like would you say you're you're focused on uh, or again yeah it was that still developing that's still developing, so we work with our flight provider with Virgin Galactic um, to do the payload integration and see what um, we can fit in for payloads uh, as well as what fits in with what other researchers in the cabin may be doing. Yep. Um, and through our work and our heritage with other space flights and parabolic flight at IIAS, we also have a laundry list of internal payloads to select from. Well, it's an interesting one. Artemis will have a, a, a female astronaut for the yes, first time. Yeah. Uh, what And around women's health uh, in space, is there anything unique there? Uh, it, I mean, there's been a number of women in space. Yeah. I'm just wondering, there must be a, a large body of work and research yet to do uh, about women in space. Yeah, that's exactly it, Chris. So um, when we look at women's health as a whole, it's understudied both in the terrestrial environment as well as in space. And part of that is because only 12 to 13% of women so far have made up the whole compendium of space explorers. So um, the sample size is small to begin with. And then the part of the other challenge is when we talk about reproductive health, most female astronauts opt for menstrual suppression through birth control, um, oral contraceptives. Yep. Um, so the data of what menstruation actually does in the space flight environment is quite scant for example yeah and pregnancy in space yes. uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if it's on the cards but you know longer term uh, it's something that we have discussed at events uh, as Absolutely, well where yeah. when we think about humans in space particularly colonies on Mars uh, you know, it's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that's another one of my areas of research focus. Um, I've authored a book chapter on sexuality and reproduction in long duration space flight, and yeah. I am the chief of space medicine at the at, at the Advanced Space Life Research Institute, right. which focuses on developing an ethical roadmap for the way forward towards making humanity a multi-planetary, permanent, off-world faring species. So yep. when we talk about settlements on Mars, um, that implies multiple generations, and we can't get to multiple generations without knowing what reproduction looks like. Yep. Um, and so there have been no human pregnancies in space, there's been no human conception in space, but we have data from everything from wasps to zebrafish to salamanders yep. and mice. So. Any yeah. problems there in microgravity? Uh, yeah. Significant problems, even just with the experiments that have been done? Yeah, absolutely. The data at best is conflicting. So we know that, for example, there are um, disruptions in neuromuscular development in developing rats and mice, and yeah. that, but those can be transient. Whereas when we look at wasps, the rate of offspring death is higher in flown male wasps. Um, and so that's, those are ju just two examples. Um, and then when we look at every aspect of reproduction that we need to study, it's everything from hormonal um, balance to arousal to copulation to uh, gamete formation to embryo implantation in utero, in utero development labor and delivery and then postnatal development so there is a lot there as well as the bio, bio psycho, social 
uh, relationships yeah. and how those work in a closed, confined environment. So, um, you know, it's it, there's a lot of study to be done. So if there's any scientists out there who are interested in this, we need good researchers. And the the, the, the difference between men uh, in that uh, sort of a female astronaut and a male astronaut, it, those sciences and those challenges, outside sexuality and the like, are they very much the same? The neuroscience and the like, the challenges are very much the same. Where, where does it align and then how far difference does it get? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. When we talk about the differences between male astronauts and female astronauts, there are some physiological differences. So, for example, women, by virtue of having a shorter urethra, are more prone to bladder infections in space. Yep. Um, and men are more prone prone to cardiovascular changes while entering the spaceflight environment, whereas women will have those once they um, arrive back on Earth post-landing. But when it comes to your question about performance and cognition, there is no gender difference. So female astronauts perform as well as male astronauts. Very good. Uh, and the other work that you do on Earth yep. uh, as well, uh, what sort of projects have you got right now? And I take it you this does link back to your, uh, your space flight as well, everything that you're doing currently. Yeah. Yeah. We'll link back. It's a long-term project for you. Absolutely. I wear a number of hats. So I am a rural emergency physician. So I work in some of the most remote and rural um, towns in Alberta, which is the province I'm from in Canada. And that actually helps inform a lot of my space medicine work. Yep. Um, so uh, I work with several commercial companies, um, some of which have been funded by the Canadian Space Agency to develop a health innovation and technology that can support both astronaut health up in space, as well as our most resource-limited and remote and rural communities in Canada. Well look, you've done Canada proud and you're the first female astronaut for Canada. Commercial female astronaut. Beautiful yeah. uh, and even well, even better, the, the fact that it's not a, not government and it's uh, it, you really do represent the civil space uh, in that regards as well. Uh, look, and the fact that you're in Perth for the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference, we mentioned you were on the panel yesterday, you've been around Perth I, I understand even today, uh, first visit to Perth? It is, yeah, and it's been a great one so far. Great, and so what are some of the highlights from the conference for you? Yeah, you know, it's been so good taking in the Australian space ecosystem. I've been thoroughly impressed and I've been even more amazed by how many similarities there are between Canada and Australia. Yeah. They're at opposite ends of the earth, but I think when we talk about the challenges in healthcare and remote and rural health, there's a lot of um, similarities as well as a lot of ways in which space-based health innovation can positively impact rural communities in Australia and Canada. Well in particular it was great to have you alongside Catherine Benel pegg as well with the Australian astronaut. So seeing two female astronauts alongside Koichi Wakata uh, really was a special uh, special thing to see I suppose uh, given incredible. what I saw in Milan as well. Absolutely and it um, was a full circle moment as well because Catherine and I knew each other as students. The first time we ever did a parabolic flight or zero G flight to was together and that was 15 years ago. So so to um, come full circle and meet back <laughs> up here in Australia as astronauts, um, you know, for anyone who might be watching starting out on the career, just believe that if you have big ambitions, you can reach them. Definitely, uh, definitely inspiring uh, for the Perth public and the Australian public while you've been here. You've represented Canada uh, extremely well. Uh, Dr. Shauna Panda, thank you so much for coming to Perth for the Indo-Pacific Space and Earth Conference. Safe travels home. You came from Ireland on this particular trip, so I do hope that you are going home. But thank you for joining us on Australia and Space TV. Thank you so much for having me.